What's up everyone? Welcome back to another video. This is Travis here with Fisher Hex. As the title states, we're going to talk about the top 30 things I wish I knew when I started the saltwater aquarium hobby. Now they're not really in any particular order. I was just thinking about it, wrote them down, so we might be bouncing around a little bit, so forgive me on that. Either way, let's, uh, let's get into it. So number one, knowledge. Knowledge plays a role in this hobby, huge, 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 huge part of the hobby. Uh, what you know dictates how you grow. Uh, it's just the way it is in life and in a lot of things. So taking the time to read books, learn water parameters, uh, and proper equipment, how to do things. And that's what this hobby, I mean, this channel is really about is teaching you uh, those kind of things to help you be successful. But um, if I could go back in time, I would have taken the time to um, learn what like salinity was and how to measure properly. I would have skipped a stupid bobber uh, that you place in the tank and it kind of tells you what your salinity is. Uh, also that other device that you dip in the water, pull it out, and then the little lever there. I don't know the name of them. It's, I can't even remember if I tried. Um, I would have skipped on that and went right to our refractometer. That's the proper way to test salinity. Uh, I would have just done that in the first place. Uh, also, t testing calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, I would have done it uh, the correct way. Um, I kind of played around with different test kits from the beginning. I would have just skipped to something like a Hanna Checker or the Red Sea test kit. Uh, I've just been very, very successful with those two uh, brands, personal preference there. Also, um, learning about corals in the first place, taking the time to learn uh, what they require, how they grow, and the best place to put them, the relationship with other corals, how they affect each other, all that stuff I would have taken the time to read early on to be successful. Um, over the years, I've taken you know trial and error, losing tons of money, um, not doing things properly. Uh, so if you are getting to the hobby, take some time to read some books and learn, okay? So that's knowledge. Put that away. Number two, being patient. This is a huge thing that a lot of people, including myself, have struggled with. Uh, being patient, um, make changes to the tank and wait for those changes to affect the tank. So when you're dosing two par, for example, uh, adjust the dose and wait a week to see how it affects the tank. Don't adjust the dose and test it 10 minutes later and see how the tank reacts, the tank isn't going to uh, going to adjust uh, quick enough. So taking the time to make changes, uh, being patient with everything, um, letting the tank mature, all those things, that's something I would have done early on. All right, so number two, that was being patient. Number three, uh, trying everything I could do to get Coraline algae to grow. That was stupid. Oh my God, I did the purple up stuff, which just didn't work. Um, I tried to get uh, snails with algae, with uh, coralline on them, you know, picking them out at the store. It was just ridiculous. Uh, the way to make coralline algae grow is very simple. Keep stable and consistent calcium alkalinity levels. Make sure your magnesium's in a good range. And then just add it. Get get one snail or a piece of live rock from a buddy. Just put it in the tank and keep proper water parameters that are stable. And uh, you know, your coralline's going to grow in time. So chasing coralline to get it to grow, uh, that was dumb. I wish I didn't do that. Um, number four, not having a drill tank. Uh, a lot of people do this. A lot of people do the oh, hang on a back overflow. Works for some people. Um, personally, I don't like fighting a war with gravity. I did it for a long time. Uh, I did the PVC overflow. I did a hang on a back overflow um, with the aqua lifter to help uh, keep the siphon going. It was just ridiculous. So if uh, you know, not having a drill tank, didn't like doing that. Some people like it, uh, but just not for me. So drilling your tank. Would have done that early on if I knew that was the right way to go. Number five, not having a big enough sump to compensate for the water if the power goes off. Uh, I tried to fit a smaller sump in my one of my original bills a while ago, um, and then the power went off, and guess what? That water just overflowed. Uh, that drained down from the from the uh, overflow, just drained uh, and overflow. Sorry, overflowed the uh, the refugium, the sump, ideally, ideally, and just soaked the floor. It was a terrible mess. So. Not having a big enough sump, always go bigger. Uh, it's not exactly better, but it is good to have some extra room just in case. That's for sure. So uh, number six, having a backup plan for power if the power goes out. This is a big deal. Um, you don't really realize what can happen to your tank in a short amount of time. If your power goes out, I mean, you can lose everything in hours, depending on what temperature your house is. If, you're, if it's 96 degrees outside, and uh, your AC goes out because your power goes out and your tank gets to 96 degrees in two hours because of the heat, uh, you could pretty much kiss everything goodbye, including your fish. Um, it's just, it sucks, man. So uh, getting a generator, battery backup, uh, it might suck to put the investment in early on, 
But trust me, when your power goes out and you see your tank dying, you're gonna wish you paid for it. All right, so having a backup plan. Uh, number seven, uh, the Apex was the best investment I have ever made in a reef tank. I can't believe I went so long without it or it wasn't this hobby for how many years without it. It's crazy. Um, life would not be the same without the Apex. Uh, it's just everything from alarms to making the tank run properly, uh, controllability, access from outside the house. Uh, I really couldn't have made a better purchase. So if you don't have an Apex, I strongly suggest you look into it. I know that I'm going to do a subscriber Q&A with Mike later on regarding the Apex to answer some of those common questions. So look forward to that. The next thing, getting your spouse involved in the hobby. That's something that I did early on. Uh, she loves it. She loves the coral. Our kid loves the tank. It's like the babysitter. Uh, I mean, we're sitting on the living room if we're getting stuff done around the house, um, setting him in his jumper in front of our tanks. He, he's just fascinated with it. Um, and, you know, just having your spouse involved really allows you to kind of get away with buying things too. So uh, doing that, I would have done that early on too. Um, ha for me, having too many tanks is a struggle. Um, having uh, two or three reef tanks is just not my thing. Um, I know I have the uh, natural freshwater freshwater plant tank in the other room, which I gotta do an update on that on that tank. It's doing pretty good. Um, that's fine because I don't really need any maintenance. But I think for me, I think having maybe two tanks max. But uh, the more you spread yourself out in this hobby uh, with multiple things, the less attention you give individual things. So say you had like four tanks. Uh, each tank is going to suffer a little bit because you're not giving them all your attention that it requires. Now, some people can manage that kind of stuff. Ooh, auto top off. Who would have thought, huh? Um, some people can manage having multiple tanks. I personally cannot manage having uh, multiple successful tanks. Just can't do it. Um, next, number 10, uh, clownfish are dickheads. Uh, yeah, that maroon clown, kind of glad he's gone. But, uh, yeah, clownfish are dicks. Uh, the, you know... By nature, they're part of the damsel family, so they're just jerks, and you know, in general. But uh, personality dependent, like these two black and white Ocelaris clowns I have are the best ever. They're great. They allow me to hand feed them. They get really close. Um, they hang out with everybody else. They don't chase anybody around. But then I had that maroon clown that uh, you know, you go through towards any part of the tank that he's at, he'll chase you around the tank. So uh, I guess it's maybe it's personality dependent. But my experience in the past. Uh, maroon clowns have just, or not maroon clowns, but clownfish in general have just been dickheads. All right. Um, and again, that falls into don't buy a lot of damsels. In the beginning, they're really cheap. They're like five bucks. So uh, a lot of people like to fill their tank with damsels, but that's cool. I did that. But when you go to add like a tang, like yellow tang, or, you know, you add a sailfin tang or something, those damsels usually start gaining up and beating up the other fish. Again, personality dependent. I have three damsels in this tank. Uh, chromis as well but and they are great they don't do anything they chase each other around a little bit but it's nothing uh, no nip fins or anything like that so uh, number 12 never add too many fish too fast um, yeah you could really do a lot of damage you start dropping fish in like crazy um, I know I used to watch you know back in the day man I used to hold on to people's fish while they were moving and all this kind of stuff man did I not know what that did to my system uh, and, you know, even though the fish was healthy, you know, just a bio load of adding like four or five tanks just to hold on to them uh, for about a month. That was just crazy. Um, you really get some nasty algae. You get some spikes and ammonia and uh, nitrites and nitrates and just phosphates. It's just it's a mess if you're not ready for it. So if you uh, do decide to add multiple fish at one time, uh, be prepared to do a nice water change uh, in about a week or so uh, just to compensate for any of that excess nutrients that might be coming. All right. Uh, number 13. Uh, don't feed your fish every time they you look at them. I know they look hungry. I know I mentioned this before, um, and I'll do a video on what I feed my fish in the schedule here later. Um, but don't feed your fish. I mean, all the time. I mean, I walk by the tank, the sailfin tank comes over, the hippo tank comes over, and they want to eat every every single time I walk near the tank. And you got to avoid that temptation. So uh, you know, don't feed your fish every time you look at them. All right, that's pretty pretty common sense. But some people, uh, you know, don't realize that. Um, Big refugium is the only way to go. Uh, I went a long time without a refugium, and uh, I don't know, man. I just once you once you get a big refugium that you're pulling, you know, five, ten gallons of chato out every two weeks, and it's just sucking the uh, those excess nutrients out of the out of the system. Uh, you really can't get any better than that. And if I had the ability, I would have a 200 gallon tank in the other room, uh, packed full of chato and tons of lights over it, just to pull nutrients out. Um, I love a big refugium. 
Um, and I do believe bigger is better with that. I know on my new build, I uh, this tank you're looking at might be my refugium, or not being refugium, but will be my sump, essentially be my sump, or this tank size in general will be my sump. And you can guarantee half of that would be a refugium. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's the plan. Um, I really haven't discussed too much about what my new build's gonna be like. Um, it's still kind of in the air for right now. But yeah, big refugium, good way to go. Um, number 15, don't believe everything you read on the forums. Uh, people are dumb. Um, you know, a lot of people just put advice out there. I know they have good intentions, uh, which is fine. But if you honestly, I go through the, I go through the forums all the time and I answer uh, the questions that I know the answer to or can provide the best information possible that I can give. Uh, but I'll come, a lot of, come upon a lot of questions and I won't answer because I don't know the answer. But you have people that go out there and just kind of throw an answer out just to do that. And unfortunately, you give bad information and you screw people over. So uh, one rule of thumb that I have is don't believe anybody until you see their reef tank. I, uh, I don't, you know, if somebody gives out information and I want to consider it, I will look through the profile, look at their pictures, um, or see what they have up there. Um, if you have a, you know, you have somebody that's on the SPS forums uh, giving all this information out and they don't have any SPS in their tank or they only have a couple pieces, you kind of got to be uh, wary of that. So uh, don't believe everything you hear. Uh, look at multiple sources and get information before you make decisions. Uh, number 16, start slow and don't rush. This could have fallen into the previous one. Um, nothing good happens overnight. And that's true. You can't expect to have a successful reef with stable water parameters and no algae and full colonies overnight or even in a month. It takes time. I mean, this tank is only, what, nine and a half months old. Um, and the amount of work that I put into just making this reef the way it is is insane. Uh, the amount of effort, the amount of money, the amount of time that I put into this reef. You guys don't see a lot of things that I do, um, but uh, I mean, this. I when I look at this tank, I see improvement everywhere. Things that I can do. Um, when you, when some people look at it, they're like, "Wow, it's great looking." All this stuff, um, but uh, don't don't expect it to be perfect in the beginning. Um, expect the nutrient issues. Expect the cycling of the rock. Um, it go you know go slow don't add too many fish and uh, enjoy the hobby you know that's the only way to go all right uh, I hope that kind of falls into don't rush uh, number 17 is a big one quarantining fish huge mistake not quarantine quarantining fish um, geez if I could just if I had the money if I could take back the money that I've lost over the years from not quarantining fish I could probably just buy a whole new system um, cause all it takes is one fish that you think looks healthy at the, fi at the fish store, bring it back home, plop it in a tank and guess what? Ick. Boom. And then guess what? Guess what? Guess what else? Everybody else has ick. And, uh, and you know, everybody dies and you got shrimp left. That's it. All right. And then you got to go through how many months of, uh, without any fish to hopefully kill off the, uh, the ick parasite. It's just ridiculous. So quarantine fish. Um, and then underneath that, uh, when you go to buy fish, look at them carefully. Look at, you know, if they have spots, sunken stomachs, not swimming well, puffy lips. Knowing what to look for when buying fish, um, that's something that I, you kind of pick up over the years, trial and error, but man, does it suck to have a $90 fish that you didn't see something about it and then have it die. So uh, really take your time when it comes to buying fish to look at them and observe them. If you can see them eat, that's even better. Anyways, uh, next 18, uh, don't chase numbers. Uh, that's a huge thing. I've been, geez, that, the, the amount of crap that I've dealt with and the uh, insanity in my own head trying to chase pH numbers and this and that and that and that. Uh, don't chase numbers. Let your tank fall into where it's comfortable. Uh, dose the proper amounts to get within the proper ranges of calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. And then uh, do what you can to uh, remove CO2 from the tank and let your pH kind of stay where it's at. But don't chase numbers, man. Don't do it. Uh, it's just gonna drive you insane. All right, so uh, number uh, 19, how much it really costs to run a reef tank. Now that I've switched to mostly DC and stuff like that, and manifolds and cut a lot of pumps out, the cost of running this tank has gone down a lot. Um, also, now that I'm making money off the reef tank, um, it kind of makes it easier. It kind of justifies the system a little bit more. But in the beginning, I had uh, you know tons of T I had T5s at the wazoo. Um, and then I had regular pumps, pump for this, pump for that, pump. it was just crazy. And then it felt like my electric bill was going through the roof. Uh, but making the changes to DC and LEDs and stuff like that really bring down the cost. Also, buying GFO, carbon, 
um, salt, all that stuff you got to take into consideration. Um, so plan ahead. If, uh, if you're not able to take care of a 30 gallon system properly, don't go and upgrade to 125 because uh, the price difference is, is pretty significant. All right. Uh, number 20, uh, don't buy coral because it looks cool, not knowing what it requires. So this kind of goes back to the previous one. Uh, just because a coral looks cool doesn't mean you should buy it. Uh, research what the coral is, research the water parameters that it requires, um, and be honest with yourself. If you're not growing, uh, you know, simple SPS, don't go buy Acroporus. Don't waste your money. It, you know, I can't, you know, I do a lot of things here, DIY stuff, because I don't want to spend the money and I don't want to uh, waste money on things that I could do here. So same thing with coral. Don't, if you're not growing basic corals, don't buy the more advanced ones. So do your research on the corals beforehand. Uh, number 21, uh, don't buy a big carpet anemones. That was stupid, man. I did that for a while. I love carpet anemones. They're really, really cool. Uh, but they ate my fish and they crawled all over, sat on top of my Montes. It was just a disaster. I love anemones, but I don't love them in my reef tank. Um, if I want to do anemones, I will probably do a separate system with just anemones and like, you know, some albino eels or you know, clownfish or whatever, but I'm not going to ever put an anemone in my reef tank. It's not going to happen. Uh, I just have bad luck with them. Um, number 22, don't hand feed eels. Uh, hand feed, eels have bad sight. Um, I've been nipped by this guy one time when he was a baby and he was only like what, five inches long and like as you know, thick as maybe a, a little bit thicker than a pencil. Right now he'd probably uh, rip my finger off. So I w you know, don't recommend hand feeding eels. Uh, use uh, you know, like a stick or something to hand feed or to feed them. And it's good to target feed, not good to throw food around in there because they end up chasing your fish around. Oh, and the auto top off is back on. You know, it doesn't kick on all day until I'm trying to make a video. Uh, number 23, uh, use proper protection when working with corals, especially soft corals. Um, have goggles, have gloves, uh, be careful uh, when working with corals. Um, you know, I've just had bad experience of getting like juice in my eye and like freaking out, trying to rinse my eyes out, just stupid stuff. So be smart in the beginning, wear goggles, uh, use the proper tools and wear gloves. All right. Uh, number 24, don't buy a lionfish because he looks cool. They're like the piranha of the salt water. Everybody wants one. Everyone thinks they're cool. They're going to be like this beast carno carnivore. But the reality is they're a lazy prick. They sit around. They don't do anything. Um, and uh, some of them, the one I had, loved hanging out wherever my hand was. So if I'm trying to work on corals, move things around, he'd come over and be like, hey, what's up? Um, so, yeah, getting stung by lionfish is not really on my to-do list. So that's pretty much part of the reason why he's gone. Plus, I had a lot of fish that could fit in his mouth. And the rule with the lionfish is if it could fit in his mouth, it's going to eat it. Um, and him and Reggie, the eel, weren't really getting along. So don't buy a lionfish because uh, they're dumb. Um, number 25, uh, do your water changes and keep up on your maintenance. That's a big deal. Uh, if you have a hard time keeping track of that stuff, use the aquatic log that I, you know, I use that. Um, and if my hunter is video, you can get a promo code to get another free month. Anyways, um, keep up with those water changes. Do your bi-weekly water changes. Uh, change your GFO, change your carbon, uh, clean your skimmers, clean your equipment. Just do it. Uh, you know, those little things you have to keep up on if you want to be successful. Oh, auto top off again. Uh, basically, uh, my power heads are about to go into surge mode right now. And when they die down, uh, before they kick into surge mode, it kicks the auto top off on. So here they go right now, stirring some stuff up. Uh, you can really see how they uh, move things around in there. Anyways, uh, number 26, equipment will fail. So always have a backup. Um, Main pumps, I always, I always like to have a backup on my main pump because they do fail. Uh, it just, it just happens. You know, they might be fine, but once the power goes out, I've had many pumps fail. Once the power try to kick back on, uh, they just do it. You see how much stuff gets kicked around with those surge modes? Modes. That's exactly why I like to have those surge modes because it really just gets everything going around. Probably not a good time to have it during the video, but um, I love that stuff. Anyways, uh, number twenty-seven. Never use soap in your hands and then put them in the tank. Uh, you know, don't wash your hands, you know, before, you know, beforehand. Huh? And then uh, put your hands in the tank and mess, mess around coral because you're going to introduce that soap and all that stuff into the tank. So uh, if you're going to do stuff in the tank beforehand, I always rinse my arm, like where you think you're, how far you're going to be in the tank arm-wise. Always rinse underneath fresh water and then paper towel dry it. All right. Uh, number 28, always epoxy your rock if you have a bare bottom tank. Um, with sand, your rock can fall, kind of be cushioned by uh, the sand, but with a bare bottom tank, it's straight to the glass. 
So if you're gonna have bare bottom tank like mine, uh, epoxy all your rock. That's that's something that uh, you, you know I learned a hard hard lesson a long long time ago about. Uh, Twenty nine. Always have extra RODI water around. I always keep thirty five gallons on hand all the time, regardless, because uh, you never really know when you're gonna need it. You might have to do a water change real quickly. You might need it for auto top off because you forgot to fill it up. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. So always have extra RODI water around. And then 30, uh, it kind of falls into the fish thing. Don't buy fish uh, for your system if you're honestly not ready for them. Um, when it comes to buying fish, and I'll get into this with my hippo tang video that I'm going to do here in the future. Uh, don't buy a fish that you're not ready for. Don't go out and buy a six inch uh, you know, hippo tang if you have a 55 gallon tank. Uh, just do your research before purchasing these fish. It's just for the sake of the fish, and for the sake of your wallet and your insanity and the system in general, be smart about it. Do your research before purchasing anything for the reef tank. All right, all right, guys. Well, that's the 30 that I come up, I came up with. I hope it was helpful. I hope it was entertaining. I hope I didn't ramble too much, and um, at least you guys got to watch the tank while I talked. Anyways, guys, as always, like, comment, subscribe. If you have anything you want to add to the list, put in this in the comment section below. If you have any questions, put in the comment section below or contact me on the Fish of Hex Facebook page. I always answer your questions. You guys know that. Anyways, I'll see you guys next time. Peace.